All right, we'll get started then. And if others join, they can be added in. Um, welcome, everybody. I'm glad that you're able to, to join together tonight. Um, <clears throat> as I think most of you know, the visioning team has, has gathered now for three retreats uh, in this process. And at our second retreat, we got to the point of talking about um, Kind of what's happening in the world you know what's the context for uh our mission and our ministry as a as a congregation and there are some things changing there and so it's important for us to, to see that together because that that is an important shaper in terms of how we go about carrying our mission forward um some of it's pretty challenging um it calls for some um, bold and, and critical decision making and, and action in the in the coming year years you know in the, over the next five years. Um, but in the midst of the challenges, there are also some significant opportunities. So uh, one I wanted to share with you that tonight, so that um, more and more of the congregation is seeing that picture and and thinking together with us about how we go forward. So I'm going to walk, walk you through this PowerPoint, um, and we'll have opportunities periodically to, to discuss. Can everybody see that okay? Yes. yes. Okay. So our consultant is Kevin Ford from Leighton Ford Ministries. And one of the things that he's um, named is this idea of true north. You know, as we move forward from this point, what, what gives our directional focus? And it's these four things that are revolving around uh, True North there. The values are the, um, the things that sort of define our personality and character as a congregation, the things that have been consistent over time. Uh, we've been discerning those, those values that make First Lutheran unique uh, among uh, Christian churches among Lutheran congregations. Um, so the values are, are sort of our congregational personality. The mission is reach, nourish, and empower people with the good news of Jesus Christ. That's, that's our calling. Um, that stays constant over time. The vision piece flows out of that mission. That, that asks the question, um, you know, who, who are we as a, as a congregation today, as a community? Uh, what's going on in the, the community around us? Um, what things have been changing in the world? Um, what's unique about this time? So that as we live out that mission, we're, we're doing that in a way that, that connects with the particular challenges and opportunities that we're facing. And then the strategy is the, the how of that, you know, specifically, how are we going to embody that vision? How are we going to live it out? So those are the pieces that are at the, at the center that define the direction. Uh, and then what we're working toward is creating alignment um, in terms of all of the other pieces of our, of our congregational life. So when you look at this facility, you know, how does that connect to the true north, uh, our internal culture, the way that we communicate ourselves publicly to the community around us. How do we recruit and uh, develop leadership so that it's, that it's shaped toward carrying out that vision and, and fulfilling our strategies. Uh, similarly, our decision-making processes and the way that we steward our, our time and our gifts. Uh, when we have those central things clear, then all the rest of this can be lined up so that we're, we're all moving in that same direction. So that's the goal of the, the visioning process that we've been involved in, is, is getting clear about those things that define true north, um, so that in the next period of time now, we can work on aligning everything to that. <clears throat> Is everybody with me so far? Yes. Yeah. Does that make sense? Okay. 
Mm -hmm. So then he used this diagram, this S-curve diagram, to help us to think about the, the life cycle of a, of a congregation or of any organization, really. Uh, so if you see the, the bottom loop of the S at the left-hand side, um, when, when an organization or a congregation starts up, there's an initial investment of, of time and energy and resources. Um, that doesn't produce much at first because you, you just got to invest a lot to, to get things moving. Uh, that may be a pastor developer that enters a community and starts to build some relationships and, and imagine what kind of congregation is needed in this space. Um, work toward getting a, a building or a meeting place. Um, gathering interest among, among people in the community to form a congregation. Um, that happened initially uh, for First Lutheran Church back in the mid 1800s. Um, so that gets that's that's gets started, and once there's some traction, the community begins to grow. Um, and as you move up this S curve, um, there's initially a, a big infusion of creative ideas, innovative efforts. Uh, you try out things and see what works. Um, there's work to expand and build relationships so that the, the congregation is growing. Uh, as it gets further up on that slope there, there, there comes a point of maturity where you've sort of figured out how things work uh, for this community. You um, institutionalize yeah, yeah, yeah. These patterns. Uh, you create... Uh, you know, almost structures for all the programs. And then in your maturity, you're maintaining those. You keep those things spinning. Uh, and at that point, there's not as much uh, effort in terms of creativity and innovation. You're, you're working on keeping, keeping something's working going. But at some point, uh, as that continues to go up there, it, it reaches a plateau where... Um, you know, you haven't, you haven't done much innovation and what used to work really well is not working so great anymore and you move into the period of decline. And in some cases that decline can, can continue down and, and an organization will, will ultimately die. But as this slide shows, there's an opportunity um, at that point to begin a new growth curve. Um, and so that's, that's where we're at right now as we work out this visioning process. Um, we, we've been in a place where the congregation uh, in terms of membership and participation and finances has been in a kind of decline for a period of years. Uh, but with a new vision, we could move into a new period of growth. Um, the challenge is that there's, there's confusion in the midst of that because the way that we used to do things is, is coming to an end and the new way that we're aiming to go isn't altogether clear yet. We're working on, you know, we're infusing that energy right now to try to figure out what that is and we're not to the point of gaining traction yet. Oops. Um, so there's a time of confusion that goes, goes with that. And uh, I've reflected that it's true not only for our congregation, it's true I think right now for the, for the ELCA as a whole and for many of the mainline congregations or denominations. Um, we've been in a decline over a number of years and we have the opportunity for new growth, but it's not clear yet what that looks like. Um, so that's, that's sort of the, um, the stage that we're in right now as a congregation and as a, a larger church and the rest of this um, presentation is going to reflect on kind of what's going on in all of that that's giving shape to it. The kind of questions that we want to ask as we, as we go through this is how, how is the culture changing? And how is God involved in that change? 
And further, how does God want us to be involved? So I'd like to just pause there for a moment and, and ask what you see. Um, how is the culture around us changing? You can throw out some examples. Well, I think unfortunately, a lot of things are changing, um, perhaps in a good way, but not necessarily good for the church in that so many, many, many um, sporting events and other things for kids happen on Sunday mornings. And so then parents don't bring their kids, they don't come, they are uh, wrapped up in something else. Okay, Heidi? Um, people uh, have more often had to have more than one job sometimes in a household. Um, also those uh, employment opportunities sometimes require a great amount of commuting. I know up until the last handful of years, I commuted 80 miles round trip a day. Mm -hmm. And um, when you have things like that, uh, in a, in a, with, while trying to keep up with everything else that's fast paced in the world, mm -hmm. it's a big uh, consumer of an individual's time. Mm -hmm. And so how do you find ways to reach people that works with their crazy schedule or, you know, not just on Sunday, but throughout the week? Mm -hmm. Good. I think the church has done a great job trying to address these changes for culture um, with the timing of the services. And of course, now during the COVID, I think we're doing a lot more outreach than we've done for several years. Okay. So we've got changes in um, employment patterns, changes in um, our use of time, um, in terms of leisure activities. Um, pandemic itself has been a huge, uh, has had a huge impact. Any other things that you want to throw out there right now? I think technology, because of technology between all of the different formats that are available for everyone to get on that are available even at a cell phone um, is taking away from a lot of the hands-on meetings or in the in-person type stuff because the the technology is just overwhelming right now and readily available. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a huge piece. We're going to be talking about that some more. All right. Anything, anyone else, Bernie, say something? I think that's a good start. Um, if we sat here and talk, thought about it more, we I'm sure come up with a number of other things that have been shifting and changing uh, that are having an impact uh, on our own personal lives and our life together as a community. Um, I'm gonna take a look here now at what specifically has, has been the impact on the church community. So if you look at trends for people affiliating with churches and faith communities, 156 million Americans are now churchless. Uh, that's about half of the population. That number has increased by 30% in the last 10 years. So that's a, that's a major shift happening in a pretty short period of time. 76% um, of that number, 156 million, uh, almost three quarter or three quarters of that are de-churched. So these are people who've been part of a faith community, who've been members of churches, who have left. Uh, in Janesville, 52% uh, of the population um, 
are nuns. They have no affiliation. 14.4% uh, are Lutheran. When you break that down in terms of uh, generation, uh, the millennials who are this year 18 to 36 make up 11% of the church population. Uh, Gen Xers, mid 30s to mid 50s are 33%. Boomers from their 50, mid 50s to mid 70s are 35% of the population and the silent generation or the builders uh, born 1945 or earlier make up 22%. So that younger age group, uh, you see a significant uh, reduction in the number of, of people who have connected or remain connected with, with churches compared to the earlier generations. 62% um, of that churchless group, the nuns, uh, describe themselves nevertheless as Christians. So they, they have that identification as Christians, but they don't affiliate with the church. So most of us have experienced a, a significant shift during the time of our, of our lives from a, a time when, when people were drawn to church, were expected even to be at church to this point where, where people are leaving, um, who are moving away. You know, so when you think about the, the strategies you know, in that true north, the strategies that flow out of the, the vision for how we, how we communicate our mission to the world. Um, if those strategies don't change, then what happens? You know, if we continue to use strategies that worked when people were drawn to churches at a time when people are moving away from church, what's the result? A continued decline, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah, there's just not a connection happening. So this is what it looks like for the ELCA. When I was in seminary, uh, the ELCA was formed, 1988. It had 5.2 million members. Uh, last year, that had declined to 3.3 million. Uh, these graphs were created by um, Dwight Shiley, who's the Vice President for Innovation at Luther Seminary. Um, he used uh, information from the ELCA's Research and Development Office and drew out the projections of that decline out into the future. And when he did that, it showed uh, a trajectory that has 16,000 people in worship in the whole ELCA by 2041 and only 67,000 total members uh, by the year 2050, which isn't that far out there. So here's a little bigger picture of that graph of weekly worship attendance. Um, so just to put that in some, some clearer context, uh, the South Central Synod of Wisconsin on their website indicates a weekly worship attendance in our synod right now of over 17,000. In 2041, he's projecting less, less than that in the whole ELCA. Or to think about it in another way, uh, if you divide that 15,811 figure across the 65 synods of the ELCA, that's only 243 people in worship in each synod on average. And our weekly worship here at First Lutheran Church last year was 359. So it's, it's a radical decline projected over just the next 20 years. That's assuming that things continue in the direction that they've been going. So our consultant asks, why do we 
concern ourselves with this visioning process. Why do we work on strategies for change? Uh, because anyone can operate effectively and still go out of business. And we can, we can continue to do what we've known um, effectively, uh, create a budget, elect leaders, have worship each Sunday, and still that decline plays out until 2041. We've, we've only got 16,000 people worshiping in the ELCA. So let's take just a moment to, to talk about your response to that, how that feels to see that and what it is that you're thinking when you, when you look at that. It seems like to me, funding is going to become real crucial as some of your graphs depicted um, the older congregation seems statistically the bigger givers mm -hmm. as they become fewer and fewer um, amidst all, you know, the ideas to generate, to get new people involved, um, the budget's going to have to shrink. Mm -hmm. Yep, so there's, there's some significant challenges that are immediately apparent. This is the second time I've seen that graph and it seems to me that going forward, we need to define maybe how we work, define worship, you know, if, if we're sharing it live stream and that, and then how we measure attendance mm -hmm. because how they're measuring it with people coming into the building but here, you know, we've been doing the um, live stream and that is, would that still be considered a worship and how we count that mm -hmm. people attending there? Mm -hmm. I, I would think, you know, that would be counted people coming via live stream. Cause again, that kind of fits into the point I made mm -hmm. where people's schedules making it available around their complicated schedules and how people choose to worship. It may be something like that live stream where someone else appreciates more face-to-face. -face. I think basically it comes down to you're got, you've gone from um, a scenario in this country where people went to church, like you said, because it was something that they were brought up and they did and they just did, and they just continued to do, to how do you make the church relevant to the people you want to seek? How do, you, how do you make the church attractive for them to want to become engaged to do something because they want to, because they feel um, excited about it, because they feel good about it when they leave versus, oh, I went there and I did my duty by going to church and hearing a message and go home. Mm -hmm. Because people do volunteer. Young people do volunteer and they volunteer for things they're passionate about. So how do you get people of all different ages, not just young people, but people of all different segments to <laughs> excited about doing something, not only to hear a positive word in a worship scenario, but to carry that message out to help others, you know, in their communities, that kind of engagement. Mm -hmm. It seems that people need to be involved in order to have any ownership and accept responsibility. Um, I was on stewardship for years and, and we needed to get some new members on that committee. And I asked a long time uh, member if she would consider joining. And she said, in all the years I've been here, nobody's ever asked me to do anything. She's just a very quiet person very capable. She was wonderful on the board. But I think we need to reach out to people and we tend to rely on the same old people. The same people do the stuff. The same people contribute the most. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there has to be expectations. And I know there's gratitude when people do step forward and, and, and give or help with things. But look, look at our BGs, you know, um, they can't last forever. 
And I know people are working, but there's still things they could do on weekends or something. Maybe we need to, as individuals, try to recruit people. Because once you get involved, you have ownership. It's part of your life. It's part of your social group. Um, and maybe we need to try to just incorporate bringing people in, making them feel useful and, and worthy. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah, so there are, there are some things that, that can be done. There are opportunities here in this and we're identifying some of those things in the conversation already. Uh, the important thing I think with, with those, those figures and those graphs is just to realize that coasting is, is coasting down. You know, mm -hmm. if, we don't, if we don't engage and, and take intentional effort to, to do some of what we've just named, um, it, the, the trend is down. Um, it doesn't have to be that, but if things continue as they've been, that's the way it's pointing. And so it's important to see that. Um, so I wanna move forward then and look at um, another piece that we've already named of what's changing, which, which offers both challenge and opportunity. Whoop. Snag the wrong thing there. Uh, here we go. So when this is, this is about uh, evolution of an institution, when the primary forms of storing and distributing information changes, institutions change. Institutions that fail to change become obsolete. So this is making a connection now to the way that we, the way that we communicate and engage one another. As humans created in God's image, our greatest desire is to be in community. Healthy institutions evolve to, in, to support or to engage the primary medium of their culture. Um, on Reformation Sunday, I talked about that shift that happened in the 16th century from an oral culture to a print culture. Um, the printing press had been developed in, the, in Europe in 1440, so it had been around for about 80 years at the point when uh, Luther and his colleagues who were reforming the church started to take action. Um, so the shift that was happening there was from an oral culture where, where it's person-to-person -person communication. Um, you think to the, you think about uh, the story of the Sermon on the Mount, where, where Jesus sees the crowds, he walks up the mountain and sits down and his, his disciples gather around him and he begins to speak, teaching them. Um, that's oral culture. Um, authority is really important in an oral culture. Um, you remember how they, how they said of Jesus, he, he teaches with authority, not like the scribes and the Pharisees. Uh, somebody who has authority um, gathers people together and, and they listen. So that's critical. In the print culture, it shifts because you're communicating now through the written word. Um, Luther invited a, a conversation with the 95 yeah. Thieves. He invited a conversation with uh, the others at his university, but that got printed in a pamphlet and distributed all over Europe. Um, so no longer one person communicating to another. Uh, it's the use of a printed book that's, that's communicating and inviting people to use their reason to discuss together. So the format for that is a classroom. And you can see that the, you know, the way that shapes our building here. We've got a whole wing of classrooms that were built uh, for, for Sunday school and for for other classes. So it's all built around uh, the print medium and, and using our reason to discuss together. There was another revolution that happened in the 20th century with the development of radio and TV. Um, that was a broadcast medium um, that allowed people to have a shared experience. 
an example is a concert. You know, everybody comes to the concert, they, they listen to the performance, um, they, have a, they have a common experience, their role is an observer. Um, and that has played out in a lot of churches too that took that shape. Uh, mega churches in particular um, built their worship spaces like a concert hall. Um, they have a worship team uh, performing at the front on a stage and uh, the congregants role in that situation is an observer like in a, in a broadcast situation. Um, so that started to sh shift the way that uh, churches were relating to the community and to new, new people. And we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later as well. Uh, the next big change that we're in right now, um, and you can see how quickly these are coming. Um, in the 90s, the development of the internet and in the early 2000s with the development of uh, smartphones, the digital tools that have, that have resulted allow people now to engage with one another um, all across the world. If you have a particular interest, you can collaborate and connect with people anywhere. Um, so the cafe model where, where you get together and you, you talk about things and meet around a common interest uh, is taken onto a, a digital platform. Um, and so in, in a way similar to the, the shift from oral to print culture, we're moving into a digital era now. Uh, and the question becomes what, what does that do for for the way that we relate to the people we want to connect with. I've got a, a video to share with you here that, that reflects on that. Uh, John Roberto is um, one of the staff with Vibrant Faith, an organization that is creatively looking at ways to, um, to teach and to form Christians and churches. Uh, Renee Engen has, has been taking a mentoring course from that organization and has had some contact with him. Uh, so this is about a five minute clip where he, he reflects on some of those shifts in, in what that looks like as we move into a digital age. We should absolutely take the digital world seriously. Um, and there's lots of reasons for today, but I wanna contrast it. Because 500 years ago, we took the printing press seriously. And I think that's, even though we lived with, with books and printing press for 500 years, we forget that 500 years ago, it was a brand new innovation. Um, and so the print, what the printing press did 500 years ago is it brought literacy to Europe and then to the world. But it also brought the Bible into people's homes. It also brought catechisms and instructional tools for churches to use. So it was a revolution in, in, in a sense, democratizing learning in the church as well as in society. And so we've used the printing press in all types, sizes, shapes, and forms over the last 100 years to communicate the gospel, to educate, to teach. But now we stand in 2016, and the 2016 printing press is the internet. It's all these new digital tools and media that are available to us. So when churches say, well, we're not sure about that, I'm sure 500 years ago, churches were saying, we're not sure about the printing press, but you see what happened when we adopted it. So we have this great opportunity presented to us, which is we have these great digital tools and technologies available to, for most of us, almost free. Um, we have great religious content in audio and video and websites, high quality produced by individuals, publishing companies, religious organizations, and denominations, all available to us. So we, we have this gap um, in, in the old days when they were wiring communities, they'd always talk about, well, we're running fiber optic cable right down your street. It's just that last mile of copper cable that we can't get the high speed into your home. Well, we have a last mile problem, is that we have the abundance of these resources. We have an abundance of these tools and technology, and we need to close the last mile, which is churches need to adopt these to communicate the gospel. Not because it's a fad, not because it's, this is the thing we should do, um, everyone's doing it, because this is the way the gospel is going to be communicated. So now we have this unprecedented opportunity to literally reach everybody in our community 
with digital media and digital tools. We have opportunity to expand our church campus into people's everyday life so that, for example, during the 40 days of Lent, every day we can be, we can be in a relationship with people, whether they are active in our community or they have nothing to do with our community, with Lenten content. Uh, each day we can connect people to vital content. Each day we could use tools like Facebook for people to interact and connect with each other around faith questions. Um, a, a church that, that, that I'm familiar with posts a daily devotion. Their church maybe is 100 members, but 300 people read that daily devotion all around the world. So they have this great public face because of social media, but it's religious content. So oftentimes we, 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 we contrast these as the work of the gospel is here and digital media is here. And I want to bring those two worlds together because I think digital media is the way we're going to communicate the gospel and an opportunity to reach people both active in our community across the whole lifespan, but also out in the community, uh, in the wider community, um, who need to be reintroduced to Jesus, to the church. We now have a way to do that. So for me, it's, it's, it's the printing press in the 21st century of the digital media and the tools. And it gives us unprecedented ways to really reach people with the good news across the whole lifespan. Um, the other thing is people bring to this new revolution, if you will, the digital revolution, they bring all the gadgets and tools already. They're familiar with all of this. So we don't have to teach anybody how to use these things. We don't have to teach anybody how to use Facebook or how to use an app on their phone. We can put our religious content into those platforms. And people will access this part of daily life. The thing that every church struggles with is how do we expand the time and the attention we have with people? Well, the digital tools and media give us a chance to be immersive, meaning we can immerse people in their everyday life with these, with these resources in a way we just can't do it physically. So it's never either or. It's physical places and it's online spaces and, it, and the digital and the physical work together. And when churches put this together, what happens is they accelerate the whole faith formation process. Uh, when they rely only on the physical, what they feel is that they're just limited in what they can do because, it's, because, it, because we have to schedule things. It has to be at a particular time. The digital world allows us to be 24 seven. And I think with the abundance that's been created just in the last five years, um, that's available to, 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 to us, we can do marvelous things across the whole lifespan um, with people that allows us to be faithful to our mission. So it's not about the gadgets. It's about the gospel. The gadgets just allow us to do the gospel in the same way Gutenberg in the printing press allowed us to get out the Bible to everybody. So let's just take a take a moment to reflect together on what we what we heard there. What sticks out to you? Um, go ahead, Heidi. The tools are in place to reach people anytime in a variety of ways. So getting messaging to people of, of varying ages can be done cheaply or, or for free. And uh, it's again, having an engaging message so that, uh, you know, they keep coming back for more mm -hmm. and feeling uh, like they want to be a part of this. They want to be a part of something. And uh, so it's finding, it's finding what messaging is attractive to different segments of the church population. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it gets at what you were saying before about how to connect with people in their crazy schedules. He's, he's naming, that's, that's one of the things that we struggle with is how to expand the time and the attention that we have with people, so. Yeah, because you can still have church services at certain times that work very well for people, but it's having these other choices for the folks that can't make a scheduled time like that. You can still have them feel like they're part of the church community. Mm -hmm. Good. Anyone else? Well, I we go to drive in church and then I come home and watch the live stream because they're just a little bit different and um and I do enjoy having the live stream option. However, I really, really, really miss being in the building and being um, 
in contact with all of the people there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were in a unique situation right now with the pandemic. Um, but uh, as he named in there, it's not either or, it's both and. Physical places and, and online spaces and, and joining those together as a way of uh, meeting both those needs. Yeah, when I was listening to this and when we were doing this topic in the visioning, you know, I, I just couldn't help but be overwhelmed with the thought that we have to do each one of these. Um, we can't leave out one part at all because in person, the imprint, the, the TV, the, the, the digital, if we're going to reach out to everybody, everybody's going to reach out in a different way. And, you know, every generation's different, every person's different. So it, it, I just, I, I really wanted to stress while I was sitting there listening that this was important, that we engage in all of them and do all of them as well as we can. Mm -hmm. We indicated that, you know, there's still oral, oral communication, there's still print in communication, there's still broadcast communication that's happening. Um, but you think again about the, the generational split of people who are part of the church and only 11% of the church right now are in there, you know, from 18 to 30, 36. Um, that's, that's the, that's the generation that's grown up with these digital tools that aren't finding ways to connect with church, generally speaking, through those tools. So investing in, in what, and that's not even the youngest generation. I mean, the children who are growing up right now are, are totally immersed in this. And so if, if we don't find ways to do that, then, um, then they're left behind. All right. Got a little bit more reflection then on um, where this where this leads as we think about the the form of the church. We should. Um, we we took some time to think then about the way that you know, as the earlier slide said, an institution that's that's paying attention and is. Uh, engaging with the primary means of storing and sharing information um, will will evolve and shift um, around that means of communication. So looking at the ways that the church has done that uh, from Christendom, which is a way of speaking about the church in the oral and the, and the print stages, uh, then to the attractional form, which is around broadcast, and then missional as a proposed way of, of responding to the digital age. So first, uh, first Christendom. Um, and in the Lutheran church grew up in the print revolution. So, you know, our experience of churches is, is reflected in the print medium. Um, what gives the Lutheran church unity is our, our theological documents. Um, you know, the, the logic of those, those theological statements that came out of the Lutheran Reformation is, is what defines the, the Lutheran church. Uh, as I mentioned before, the, the classroom wing in this, this building uh, is a physical representation of the way the church is structured around uh, uh, print culture. Um, in that environment, ministry mostly happens at the church building. Uh, a professional has done most of the ministry. The pastor's job is much like a private chaplain who provides pastoral care during times of difficulty and crisis. Um, I reflect on my seminary education, uh, graduating in 1990, it was still, um, the expectation was that there's already a community formed and that I go there to preach and teach, administer sacraments, um, be present in times of difficulty and crisis. Um, That's, that's pretty much the model. And in that environment, discipleship is for children. You know, we have a clear path um, through Sunday school with Christmas programs and vacation Bible school, uh, leading then to confirmation and maybe youth ministry in high school, but 
once a once a person graduates from high school and maybe even from the point of confirmation, they they've completed their um, discipleship training. Um, there's opportunities for adults, but there's not like any kind of continuing path that way. Um, and in that uh, in that environment where church is at the center, um, that's the time when when people were drawn to church, as we were talking about before. Um, so the expectation was that most people are Christian. Missions and evangelism then are done with uh, unreached people groups overseas. So that's the that's a rough, you know, broad stroked picture of of the church in the print culture. And then when we move into the broadcast age, uh, a lot of that shifts. Now it's it's about attracting people to the broadcast. So the church is competing to be the center. Um, this is the baby boomer generation that grew up after World War II. That's the time period when that really took root. Um, it was enhanced by the media broadcasts of television, especially as that, that grew to become central in our culture. Um, some of the qualities of, of that culture and environment is that things are fun and entertaining with something for everyone. Um, church, churches focus on the best of everything, programs, music, teaching, because, uh, you know, like the Nielsen ratings with TV, you're, you're trying to draw an audience. And so best quality and everything that you do will, will allow you to compete with the consumer culture around you. Uh, so when you think about a mega church that has yoga classes, on-site restaurants, and cafes as, as ways to draw in and engage people, uh, that's related to the, the communication environment. The culture is casual, come as you are. Um, worship is seeker-friendly. Evangelism is done through invitation. And the goal is to get them back again next week. And bigger is better. <clears throat> and now we move in then into the digital age. Now it's clear that the church is no longer the center. You know, people are moving away at an amazing rate. Um, so the challenge now is to embrace our missional calling which means to be sent from the, the mission of God. Uh, so at the end of, end of John's gospel, uh, the resurrected Christ appears to the disciples in a, in a locked room and speaks to them words of peace and then says, as the Father sends me, I am sending you. So we're sent out into the world as Christ was sent um, to connect with those, those people who, who aren't looking for church. Uh, we're the people of God partnering with God in that redemptive mission to the world. So it, it turns it. Now the mission has a church, not the church has a mission. The mission is at the center. So the emphasis then is on going out to be with. There's an outward focus to, to go out and be with people. And it's a way of living more than a Sunday activity or an affiliation, like being a member of a Lutheran church. Uh, it's, a, it's a way of living through, throughout the week, which locates God's redemptive activity primarily outside the walls of the church in daily life. That calls then for a focus on disciple making or teaching people to become followers of Jesus on an ongoing based process. Uh, it's lifelong. It, doesn't end at confirmation, doesn't end at high school graduation. Um, it continues throughout our life. And all of this focuses on relationships. Where does it come in for repentance and sin? And um... <laughs> Say that again. I couldn't hear what you said. I think it was important. 
I said, where does that come in when you're out in the community in, in teaching people about repenting and sin and um, the other things that are in the Bible? That's, that's, I think, what the disciple making is about. It's about teaching people to become followers of Jesus. So uh, it's, it, the, the, the idea, though, is that that's not, that's not centered in a church building. It's something that's happening um, in relationship on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's, it's using the digital tools that we were just talking about, as well as those times when we gather together. So it's not about it's not about changing the gospel. It's like at the beginning, the number one there. As the Father sends me, I'm sending you. Um, Jesus came um, teaching and modeling, and now we are sent to do the same. Uh, I've got another brief video. I'm just going to show a segment of this one. Um, this is Heidi Campbell, who's a uh, professor at Texas A&M University, where she focuses on digital media and, and religion and the relationship between the two. I think some of the soapboxes that I've been kind of pounding on for the last decade is one is that the claim that people are, are worried that people are going to plug in, log on, and drop out of church. The research on the internet says, shows that people who use new technologies are actually more engaged civically, politically, you know, in their, in their local communities, that the, the internet and digital culture provides a supplement, not a substitute for um, community and uh, engagement. Um, but what's interesting is then to look at, well, what is it actually su um, supplementing? And for a lot of these people, it's, you know, it's the relational content, whereas like the church or the institution gives them a structure, but it doesn't give them the social interactions, opportunities for engagement or debate. You know, a lot of churches are still on a broadcast kind of model. And even ones that try to do kind of small group, it's still, it's the kind of a very hierarchical structure, but it's not innovative ways of thinking and being. And so, you know, I think that, you know, the internet can teach churches of, hey, there's certain social patterns that are encouraged, you know, kind of a, a, a wiki-based theology where it's a very interactive that does have some guidance. It's not a complete free-for-all. But, you know, doing theology in that way is very different than, you know, the Scottish school teacher teaching here and, and just kind of imparting you know, wisdom into, or knowledge into the students. And so I think you know, the internet provides us, if we understand digital culture, how, why people spend so much time on social media platforms in these discussion groups, we can begin to see these are actually the values and priorities people have. Well, in what ways can we um, uh, incorporate that into, you know, our church structures, into our ecclesiology, into the experiences, opportunities, and education that we're trying to offer people. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah, it's okay, I'm going to stop it there. Um, so I think she's she's emphasizing again the that it's both and uh, the, the digital piece is a, a supplement that provides opportunities for engagement and people to be in conversation with one another, a different form of learning. What other what other reflections do the rest of you have as you as you heard that piece? I think it's going to be a balancing act, you know, just trying to figure out how much to do of each one. And how to how to blend those, I think, how to, right. how to bring those into connection with each other. And perhaps COVID is showing us ways that work uh, that we wouldn't have otherwise experienced. Yeah, we're practicing these kind of meetings that we wouldn't mm -hmm. we wouldn't probably have done before. I would like to add uh, some food for thought. If we don't understand the needs of the demographic, it's going to be difficult to fulfill that need. So we have to go out into the community and find out where the needs are 
and then mm -hmm. try to figure out ways to fulfill that. Mm -hmm. As otherwise, you're basically chasing a mirage mm -hmm. because what you think it might be maybe 180 degrees off. Mm -hmm. That's a very good point. It's related to that outward focus. It's related to being sent. Um, going out to build relationship. I think it's about um, doing more than listening to the word. It's living the word. In other words, again, showing um, your support and beliefs, your actions. And that may not just fall on a Sunday. That might be any other day of the week or any other time of day. Mm -hmm. And so by uh, doing those things, it will, you know, get different people, hopefully, uh, involved to be a part of those, whatever those things you determine you want to achieve in the community. Mm -hmm. And that could be not only the community of the church, but the community that, where we reside. Mm -hmm. We could be reaching a larger, I mean, worldwide community. You know, people, anybody in the world could be watching our live stream or mm -hmm. um, it's a much larger community. Mm -hmm. And also, I, I do think we have to change the way we measure our outcomes or measure our accomplishing our mission. It's not just the in-person attendance. Mm -hmm. A couple of years ago, I participated in an online vocal academy that met like this. And um, there was a woman from Sarajevo. There were people from across the United States. There was a guy from a uh, South Pacific Island, you know, all interested in learning how to sing and connected through the internet to this, this opportunity. Uh, there was a guy living in Berlin, you know, so we were, we were all over the place. Um, Young woman from, you know, yeah, a young woman from Scotland, um, and they had different different styles of music they were interested in, but but we were all able to, to come together and and encourage each other and strengthen our singing together. So it was a great experience. And I think something like that is beyond what we've imagined before, but the tools yeah. make that possible. And I, I think the twenty year olds are are in that they have friends that they connect with all over the world. So. Mm -hmm. They're used to that. Yep. I think I've got oh, someone else. Go ahead. I thought Barb, 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 here. She's on mute. Oh, you're Barb, on mute. You're on you're mute? Barb. Okay. There you go. Um, I know why I was muted. The dog was barking. You hear so, there's so many financial programs on the radio and TV and you know, they always say, pay yourself first, you know, put it into your savings first. Maybe spiritually, we may have to make a, an emphasis on that. Church shouldn't be the last thing you, go, you think about. It shouldn't be, I'll go to church if I have nothing else to do Sunday. Um, you know, I'll volunteer if I have nothing else to do. Maybe it has to just become a higher priority and maybe it has to be pointed out to people. You know, everything is competing for people's money, their attention. Um, <clears throat> ways to fill their lives. I think we need to say, no. we have to ask, um, can you, can you not just monetarily, but can you give more for, of yourself? And can you um, make this a more important priority in your life? Yeah, and I think what, what both uh, John Roberto and Heidi Campbell were naming were that there's there's ways of making that invitation and ways of connecting um, that haven't been possible before that that become possible now, in addition to the ways that we have have done that in the past and will continue to also connect. Um, I'm going to share a couple more slides. The first one is uh, just sort of naming the shift in mindset or the shift in um, shift in understanding and the shift in uh, relationship and, and action that are 
that we are required for the church now. So ecclesiastical just means of the church. Church shifts. Um, we were at the center at one point, and now we're moving to the margins. Uh, like Vern was just saying, we've got to we've got to get out into the community to even know what the needs are, um, what the desires are. Um, we we move from being a majority of the population to a minority as more and more and more people have been um, disaffiliating. Uh, we were well established. We were the settlers, and now we're the sojourners. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. We're on a journey. Uh, we move from being in control, um, you know, controlling the establishment to being out in the world giving witness. We move from maintaining the structures to, to being, again, on a journey and mission. And it, it's a shift from, from an institution to a movement. So it'll take a little bit to sort of wrap our minds around that, uh, what those shifts mean for us and, and how they change the way we, um, the way we seek to, to, carry, to carry out our mission, to reach, nourish, and encourage, or to empower people with the good news of Jesus. So again, what's, what's at the center of our calling hasn't changed, but it's the strategy for how we bring that to the people we're called to, to connect with. Um, and to give us one more thought about that, uh, I have a, a short video from uh, Phil Bodel, who's a creative arts pastor at Westridge Church, and he's talking about the ways that church communication has been revolutionized. I just wanna catch his concluding statement. Um, these things that our message matters that's why we've got to lean into this stuff so the felt need that most churches have when they're communicating their messages they want more ways to advertise they want more people to get to their events for us for people to come to us as the church the challenge is we're missing so many opportunities when we look at all these communication channels as just a way to advertise and just to market the reality is, is these are actually the tools that we have to engage people better than ever before when you think about social media, text messaging, email, um, you know, it, all these tools really are a way, it, it, these, these are two-way tools that, that we have to actually to communicate and to engage back. They're conversation tools. And when we use them as a church just to blitz people with announcements, we're limiting the impact and reach that we can really have. So for us as a church, we have to reshape our thinking of these as the digital mission field, not just the digital promotion field. Uh, it's not an extension of your bulletin. It's an opportunity for you to be in, be joining the mission field that we have on all these channels to engage more people than ever before. Thanks for listening. So again, he's, he's talking about that shift in mindset. Um, we're, we're still in the broadcast age, so we use digital tools to get our message out and try to get people to come here uh, to our building, to our gatherings, uh, to our community established as First Lutheran Church. When, as he's pointing out, we have a you know, digital mission field rather than a digital promotion field. We have tools that can allow us to engage and be in conversation with people, not just to tell them our story. So making that shift in thinking and then uh, working out strategies to use those tools will be part of our challenge in the next, in the next few years. Any final reflections, questions, thoughts? Karen. Well, I, think, I think that the strategy is going to be different now than it will be after COVID. You know, there'll, there'll be, have to be an interim strategy and then uh, different means, I think. Mm -hmm. Do you see particular distinctions or are you just sensing that there's a different period right now and it's gonna change when that ends? Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah. I would encourage folks to share this with somebody who hasn't seen it because watching it the second time, it more sinks in and seems like you can get your head around it more. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, having made this presentation a few times now, it's starting to come clearer, clearer, and clearer for me. So. Um, good. Well, thank you, thank you for participating to, to tonight. Um, the recording will they'll send you a message when when it's ready. And if you could send me the link, Mary, then I'll I'll make sure that we get that out to others so that the rest of the congregation can listen to it when they have an opportunity. Um, because again, I think I think it's important. And, and as Mary just named, it doesn't sink in right away. It, it takes a it takes a while. It was a year ago that I read that article by Dwight Shiley about the decline in the ELCA, and it was just mind-boggling. Well, what do we do with that? It takes a while to sort of think through that. And I, and I want to, us together to be grappling with those questions um, so that, we, that we're seeing together why we need to move in a different kind of way in order to accomplish our, our purpose. Um, so I, I'm really grateful to to those of you who are on right now, who are part of the visioning team, uh, it's, it was a great group um, and they're continuing the work um, over the next couple of months here. And then we're planning on January 17th to find a way, it'll probably be mostly Zoom like this, uh, but a way to, to communicate that whole picture um, and spell out sort of what the direction for the coming year is gonna look like and, and, uh, and then beyond that. Um, so if we can be if we can be thinking about these questions in the meantime, it will prepare us then to take the next steps when we when we get there in 2021. All right, uh, Sarah wrote a note. Thank you. This was really great. Um, we didn't show her video because her daughter's loudly eating dinner. <laughs> <laughs> all right. well, I'm glad you were able to join us, Sarah. And uh, thank you all for being a part of it. Um, have a good night. <laughs> good job. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. <laughs>